It's really a great pleasure for uh, five guys from Redondo Beach to appear here on the Craft Music Hall. Now you've all seen our faces, how about learning our names? Johnny Barbeda on drums. Well, I was in a parochial school back in uh, New Jersey when I was a kid. We went to the, uh, a dance that night. I just got attracted to the band. I just went right down to the front of the stage and saw these guys playing and I saw this drummer in the band and the music just enticed me and I said, right then and there, I said, I want to be a drummer. Well, I started out in uh, San Luis Obispo uh, playing high school football and I figured, well, you know, guys in football, they get the girls, but sort of the band, but at least you don't get hurt. So I decided to get into a band and I got into a band called uh, The Sentinels. And believe it or not, when we were in high school, we had a number one hit called Latina, which was a West Coast hit. From that fateful decision arose an incredible rock and roll legend. Johnny Barbada, an awe-inspiring drummer to this day, would go on to play with some of the biggest names in the business. He recently compiled his fascinating experiences into an autobiography. It's like a historical era of the era that I was in and all the people I've met, from Van Morrison to Joni Mitchell. You know, uh, there's stories in there about uh, James Taylor, the Rolling Stones. It just goes on. There's just tons of stories. It's a must for every reader who's into music. Johnny's career is so full of interesting stories that it's difficult to pick just a few. But there are certainly highlights, moments he helped create that have stood the test of time. Gene Clark of the Birds was a good friend of mine. And he came down to the club one night and said, that, hey, the Turtles are looking for a drummer, and I recommended you. <laughs> Bones Howe was the producer, he was a big producer. He told me this, oh yeah, get that drummer, he's great, get that drummer. And so they got me and uh, first song I played on was Happy Together, which is the biggest single of the year. And to this day, it's in the top 50 ever recorded. Turtles, you know, we had, they had 10 hits of which I was on seven of them, like four number one hits. And we did Ed Sullivan, Smothers Brothers, Hollywood Palace. They did a lot of television. The Turtles were exposed. Everybody knew who they were. Turtles had never wrote a hit single. We were in the Astor Towers in Chicago, and we decided to write a hit. And at first, we were going to do a spoof on it, but we decided to do and make a shuffle like Happy Together was a shuffle, and we ended up writing. It. And that song had really had magic. <laughs> As a member of the Turtles, Johnny was part of the late 60s rock and roll renaissance. Just being in a popular band at the time opened up an exciting world of opportunity. When Happy Together was number one, uh, we went over to England to do a tour over there. First of all, we got off the plane and we went outside and we saw this big white Rolls Royce. We said, wow, look at that. And then this guy standing there with the sign Turtles. We all looked, looked at each other, wow, and we jumped and ran into the, into the, the uh, the Rolls Royce, and it turned out that it was the Beatles Rolls Royce that they had rented from, and so we could use it, you know, kind of impress us. And then we think, well, what else could happen today? We thought we were going to go to bed and crash, and they said, no, there's a, there's a nightclub you're going to be playing out tomorrow night that you need to go out, go and see. So we got there, and we walked in there, and, and uh, then we looked over, and they weren't any farther from you to me. There was Ringo and John sitting. So our managers introduced each other, and then he invited us to come over and sit down. So I'm sitting between Lennon and Ringo, and... Uh, I don't know what to say. I, what do you say? How's the weather? So I leaned over to him. And I said, "John, I guess it was. If it wasn't for you guys, you probably wouldn't be here." And he goes, "What do you mean? You know, Beatles, Turtles?" And he, and he got real humble and said, "Well, everything we got, we stole from Chuck Berry." Johnny stayed with the Turtles for a few years until he started itching for a musical change. His next move would be a one-time recording session with the Los Angeles-based supergroup. 
the resulting album is still considered one of the finest from an era full of huge musical talents. I quit the Turtles because I didn't see them going anywhere. At the end of their career, they were writing their own music and it wasn't really that good. And I wanted to step out into something a little different. And so I produced the LA Getaway album. I got that whole thing together and got Paul Rothschild who produced Janis Joplin and uh, Jim Morrison of the Doors. And he thought it was the best album he ever recorded, which is like an underground album. We had Dr. John, Booker T, Leon Russell playing on keyboards, like the premier keyboard players in the world at the time. The L.A. Getaway album cemented Johnny's reputation as one of the best rock drummers out there and the heavy hitters came calling. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young had fired Dallas Taylor because Neil didn't like him, frankly. But, so I ended up doing the gig and uh, that went on to, you know, I did six or seven albums with them. The Four Way Street album, which sold something like five million. Then I did a Neil Young solo album. That was a big thing when he called me up and said, Kenny Buttrey, the number one national drummer, he says, not making it. Will you come down and play for him? He said, sure, you know. And I sped down in my 57 Chevy to the airport, just made the airplane. Although Johnny played on several Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young projects, there was one song that really stood out. It was a protest song written by Neil Young in response to four Kent State University students being shot and killed by National Guard troops in 1970. Well, that Ohio song, Neil wrote it, and that week we recorded it and got it in one take, and it was out in the airwaves within another four days. So in a period of 10 days, wrote, recorded, and on the radio. It was the mood of the country was like half was with, with it, half was not with it. And uh, it was pretty phenomenal at the time. Because of Johnny's high-profile stint with Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, new projects kept coming his way. One of those projects, had he been in the position to accept it, certainly would have altered the course of his career. David Geffen, he had Asylum Records, and I was like the staff drummer on their, their label doing all their solo projects. David called me into his office one day, sat me down and said, uh, well, John, there's this new group, and uh, they're going to really be big, and they want you. And I said, who are they? He said, they're, the, they're called the Eagles. I said, the Eagles? I never heard of them. He leaned forward in my face and said, they're going to be real big, and they want you. And I said, wow, that's really flattering, David, but I never heard of them. I, I, I'm sure they're going to be big, but I'm, I'm with Crosby, Slows, Nash, you know, which is the biggest group in the world right now, you know. You know, and who knows? Maybe if I had to play drums for the Eagles, Don Henley would have been a guitar player, lead singer type of guy. Johnny may have passed on the Eagles, but soon another exciting opportunity presented itself. The Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young collaborations had started to unravel, and the much-in-demand drummer was once again available. It was David Crosby who suggested Johnny's next project. David Crosby was good friends with The Airplane, which was Gray Slick and Paul Kantner. In San Francisco, they were like, you know... Them and the Grateful Dead were like big groups. I mean, you know, you walked down the street and people like idolized you. So it was a different thing. And I got in that group and that lasted two albums with the airplane. And I was the only drummer to be both in the airplane and the Starship. That was a great ride because uh, I not only got to do drum solos in that band like I did in the Turtles, but I was able to do uh, sing, sing songs. And matter of fact, I wrote a song called Big City. Johnny's run with the Starship proved exceptionally successful as the band had a string of gold albums. The band hit its commercial peak with the song Miracles, a single from the album Red Octopus that received an amazing amount of radio airplay upon its release in 1976. Just as he had with Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young and the Turtles before that, Johnny once again found himself drumming on songs that would sell millions of copies. Well, Miracles by the Jefferson Starship, that, that whole thing was really magic. Of course, the album was too. In 1982, Johnny met his wife of 22 years, Angie, at a nightclub in Los Angeles. Angie's from the Ada area, and that is how the legendary rock and roll drummer would eventually settle in these parts. We were living in what we thought was paradise up in Mendocino, California. You know, they're famous for their grapes and apples and fishing and redwood trees and logging and, you know, all that whole thing. So after living there 25 years, we decided that maybe it was time to check out of there. Get down to visit Angie's relatives, and I started looking around and saying, wow, this is kind of a nice town and uh, this is a good place to live, so we decided to move here. Johnny currently operates a recording studio out of his home east of Ada and gives the occasional drum lesson. He and his wife have also made some excellent music together in the past decade, including the Heartland album under the band name Oklahoma. Although Johnny's already drummed on more than 100 albums and 20 hit singles, he says there's more to come. I think what my wife and I did, this new CD coming out called California, it's just got great stuff on there. But the best is still coming, I think. I'm going to have a big band someday, like Buddy Rich had. It. Very interesting life that I've led. I've been very fortunate and blessed to have gone through what I've done and come through this whole craze and 
still be alive and well.